Well, during this uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, one of the obvious differences in our daily lives is the consumption of unleavened bread. And some of you, I know, will bake that at home. Um, I have not baked bread in a long, long time, so I don't typically bake any unleavened bread. Uh, sometimes others do at the house. But most of the time, I would just purchase the unleavened bread in the form of matzos. So we've I've done that this year. And, uh, of course, as we eat that unleavened bread, uh, we can reflect on and think about some of the lessons that, that we can learn from these days. And uh, I'd like to talk about one of those lessons. It's something I've been reflecting on, and I thought I would share that with you, some of these reflections. Going back to uh, the night that he was betrayed, one of the passages of Scripture that we read on that evening and that some of you undoubtedly have read on many occasions was Jesus' prayer in John 17. And when he said those words, I, I would like to um, quote part of it towards the, um, the middle there, starting in verse 9. Uh, Jesus said, I'm, I'm praying on behalf of them, on behalf of his disciples. I'm not praying on behalf of the world. And then in verse 11, he says, I am no longer in the world. Because he knew he was about to be uh, taken by the Romans and then beaten and then crucified. But he says, I'm no longer in the world, but they, meaning his disciples, his followers, those who would believe in him, they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. And Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. And in verse 14, he continues. And he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world. So here you have this, this contrast. We are in the world, but we do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. Uh, there's not some kind of rapture occurring at this point. We're going to be leaving the world. No, we're still in the world, but we're not of the world. But I'm asking you to keep them safe from the evil one. Verse 16, they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I set myself apart on their behalf so that they too may be truly set apart. But notice again, verses 14 and 16 repeat the same expression. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. And so this is something I've been reflecting on as I uh, thought about what I was going to speak on this afternoon. We're in the world. Uh, we live in the world. We're affected by the world. Clearly, sicknesses, diseases can af affect and afflict all of us. And yet, at the same time, we do not belong to the world. We have been purchased. We have been rescued, we have been redeemed by Jesus. And of course, um, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about contagion a little bit later on, and I, I guess that's a topic that's very much at the forefront of our minds, contagion and infection and so on. But uh, let's, let's just reflect on what Jesus was saying here in John 17. Jesus has defeated Satan. Satan of the world. Constitution is on the same level as the Bible. But let's stop to consider for a minute. What is the population of the United States right now? I know we're going through a census. We'll fi find out the exact figure uh, by the end of the year, hopefully. But right now, I think the best calculation says we're, we're at 330 million. 330 million. What about the world's population? world's population is at about seven and a half billion. So for those of you who are good at math, what is that as a percentage? Well, it means that the United States is less than 5% of the world's population, which means, looking at it from the other perspective, that over 95% of the world is not living 
under the U.S. Constitution. 95 percent, 96 percent. Now Christianity isn't evenly spread throughout the world, but let's suppose for a moment that it was. It makes the math a little easier. That would mean that proportionally we Christians in this country would represent only percent of the world's Christians. All American Christians would only be about 4% of the world's Christians. So whether we have a Republican administration or a Democratic administration in power, that issue is directly relevant to only about 4% of the world or only about 4% of the world's Christians, however you want to look at it. So here's the question. Is the choice we make in a political election in this country or in any other country for that matter, but we're talking about the U.S. right now, is the choice we make in a political election an essential part of being a Christian? It can't be, because if it was, then 96% of the world would not be Christian, because they can't make that choice. They cannot participate. They wouldn't qualify. And I'm making this argument just so we can gain a little perspective on the point I believe Jesus was making in his prayer when he said they are not of the world. They're in the world, but they're not of the world. There is a separation. Now, if we reflect even further and look at the whole of human history, the whole of recorded human history, and let's consider that human beings have been operating on this planet for, say, 6,000 years. And the U.S. has existed for, what have we said, maybe 250 years. What is that as a percentage? Anybody want to guess? Well, you guess it's about 4% of human history. The U.S. has existed for about 4% of that time. So for 96% of human history, believers, believers in God, obviously we wouldn't call them Christians for all that period of time because Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, wasn't here for uh, ask Jesus Christ for the er earlier period. But believers, people who believed in God, have lived under systems and in countries that knew nothing about the United States or the Constitution of 1787. And so it seems to me that we have to be aware that sometimes it's possible to conflate American politics with Christianity. And we need to not do that. We forget, as I said so many times already, that the entire country amounts to only about 4% of the world's population. So we're only a fraction of the world's Christians. So we need to clearly see that our view as Christians must transcend the barriers of nation, the, the national and the political barriers that exist in the world, because those are things of the world. Let, let me just throw a few other examples uh, out for you, for you to consider. Uh, we have uh, Christians in Argentina. Um, Mr. Haver has mentioned Bernie several times. Well, uh, Bernie is originally from Argentina. Uh, and, of course, there are Christians there, believers in, in Argentina. Well, back in 1982, there were believers there, too. And we have believers in Britain. Uh, and they were there in 1982 as well. And guess what happened in 1982? Uh, I know Mr. Avey would know the answer. Uh, there was a war over some islands in the South Atlantic that the British know as the Falklands and the Argentines know as the Malvinas. And um, people in Argentina from childhood are taught one particular view about who owns those islands. And people in Britain... Well, actually, they don't teach them about the Falklands because they're not that important in, in British view. But still, if they study history, they would say, yeah, those are British islands. And so what happens if there's a war between Britain and Argentina over those islands? Where do Christians stand? What is the Christian view? Uh, are the British right? Are the Argentines right? What is the, British view? Uh, what is the Christian view? I mean, I'm not telling you what the Christian view is. I'm just throwing that out there to say that some of these things should actually not be uh, a part of the, the Christian perspective in that we're not of the world. We are not of the world. We are affected by things in the world, but we have to remain the, uh, somewhat s uh, separate. Um, how about World War I? 
How about World War I? We had several countries obviously involved, but let's go to the beginning of the war and Britain again. The British fighting the Germans in World War I. And this was commented on by people at the time. Both people, both the British and Germans, both Christian nations, both praying, presumably, to the same God. And the Germans saying, Gott straf England, God strike England. And of course, the British, presumably praying something similar about Germany. So if you're a Christian in Britain, or you're a Christian in Germany, World War I, what should your prayer be? Would you be involved in the politics? Uh, or would you remember what Christ said, that they are in the world, but they are not of the Allied side? 18 million on the central power side, for a total maybe of 50 million people today. Huge, huge losses. So again, the reaction was, if this is how Christian nations behave, let's forget about Christianity. This is not the example that we want to give as Christians. Of course, the United States had its own conflict earlier, the U.S. Civil War. Loss of 800,000 lives out of a total population of about 31 million. So almost 1 million out of 31 million. And in Lincoln's second inaugural, he commented on that. He said, both, both sides read the same Bible. They both pray to the same God. And each invokes his aid against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered. And that of neither has been answered fully. So there is a, there is a, a, a huge irony as well as a huge stumbling block to people when Christians start to take sides in the world instead of remembering that they are Christ who is not of the world. They're in the world, but they're not of the world. So politics, this is my point, Politics should be kept separate from Christianity, not conflated with it. And again, we could give many, many other examples. I thought of, uh, in the New Testament, Cornelius, Acts 10, Roman centurion, who presumably had to take some sort of oath of loyalty to the Roman emperor. I, I assume that was a, a requirement. So. He was there to support the interests of Rome. Yet, God gave him the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. He was a Christian. He and the people of his household. Now, how did he behave later when, you know, in AD 70, Jews wrote, I don't know, maybe he retired from the army by then. Hopefully he had. But we have to understand that politics has to be kept separate from our identity as Christians, because our Christianity, our belief as Christians, transcends barriers and politics and, and nations and so on. All Christians, regardless of their country of origin or of citizenship, are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, one that is permanent and that transcends all the kingdoms of this world. Each day uh, during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, as I said, as we eat this unleavened bread, we should be thinking of how to do God's will. Uh, Mr. Haver gave a, a, a great uh, Bible study on, you know, the top ten uh, things that we'd want to do in our lives, you know, and I suggested to him afterwards, uh, why not a top twenty? You know, but he had many things for you to think about, for us, for us to reflect on. What are, what are the things, what are the expectations that God has of us? And we should be seeking to do those expectations in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And as we do that, we will be living and exemplifying the kingdom life in our small corner of it. And then people will be able to say, ah, I see that Christians, regardless of nationality, regardless perhaps of their political views, they are still one. As, as Jesus prayed. Uh, in Acts 17, let me read a couple of verses from Acts 17 that uh, struck me in this context. Uh, Paul said, 
uh, here, he's preaching to the uh, Athenians, from one man he made all the nations. Ultimately, we are all descended uh, from Adam, and then later on, of course, uh, from Noah. But from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So even though we could be spread out and have different backgrounds, different ideas, different ideologies, different political positions, none of that should interfere with our unity in Christ. So hopefully uh, the point I've tried to make is that it is important to separate our Christian beliefs and our Christian walk from the politics of this world, whether it's in this country or if you're a Canadian from the politics of Canada or of South Africa or of ever, any nation. We are in the world without being of the world. At the beginning, remember I said I talked about infection and contagion. Well, uh, here it is. Being of the world, I submit to you, is, is it's infectious. It's contagious. It's powerfully so. You know, we, we're in, and it, it affects us. We're in this world and we can, you know, we can physically get whatever diseases are out there that are contagious. But what's the sort of contagion that we are being warned against uh, in Jesus' prayer? Well, how about hate? Is there hate in this world? Well, there sure is. There is plenty of hate. Uh, I, I sometimes, I, I shouldn't say I'm surprised. I, I, I'm, I'm too old to be surprised. But it, it's still sometimes disappointing to say the least, to see how much hate people express to other people, towards other people. And sometimes just because of their uh, opinion or view. But there's hate. That's contagious. What about Christians? What should we be involved in? Well, we should be involved in love. Love towards God, as we heard, and then love towards neighbor. What else is contagious from the world? Division. Divisiveness. Instead of what well, we should be thinking about, unity and brotherliness. Well, what else is contagious out there in the world? Revenge, vindictiveness, instead of forgiveness. So we, we as, as we read in Hebrews, we're so easily beset by sin. We can be easily infected by these attitudes of the world. We don't have to make any effort. In the same way that we're hearing about how easily, if we are around people who are contagious, how easily we can become infected. Well, the same thing happens being in the world. We can be very easily infected by those things. Uh, I just happened to listen to a, a report, again, a couple of days ago, a few days ago, on the radio. I was listening to this uh, story uh, about baking bread. Uh, and you're, you're perhaps wondering, how does that relate to this topic? Well, bear with me. They were talking about baking sourdough bread. And uh, let, me, let me just quote. I, I, I found the, uh, the transcript, so I just put it here in, in, in my notes. Uh, and, and the uh, presenter is saying, take a trip to the grocery store. You may notice staple products are missing. For some people, that includes yeast. Those little envelopes with the pellets that make bread rise. Now, I haven't been looking for yeast in the store, so I don't know if it was missing or not. And that presents a problem to some who are taking up baking as a new quarantine hobby. So we've got solutions. And so then this person says, the basic sourdough recipe is just flour, water, and open air. Flour, water, and open air. And uh, mentioned that this person has a, has a video series. And, and um, here's an easy fix to fix the run on yeast. How to make your own sourdough starter. All you need to do is put flour and water in a bowl on the counter. 
Every now and again, add a little more flour and more water. Let it ferment. And soon you'll have your own living, breathing sourdough starter. Essentially, you're doing a controlled rot of a food that has a beneficial value to it. And you'll never need to buy yeast again because the starter has natural yeast in it. But what caught my eye, or my ear in this case, since I was listening to the story, was this controlled rot. Of course, that doesn't sound particularly appetizing. But I think yeast here and rot, rottenness, I think that, for me at least, ties very much in with what we're trying to avoid during these days. Now, I'm not saying that yeast is bad. I'm just saying that the point that is being made here, or that I'm trying to make using these words, is this is part of the rot of this world that we're supposed to come out of that we're not supposed to be a part of. It's there, but we're supposed to reject it, resist it. it, it in essence, it's everywhere around us. You can just put this, this flour and water in a bowl in the, in, in, out in the air, it's there. It, it, this, this process will happen wherever. It's everywhere around us, which means we have to struggle to resist, to overcome, not by our own strength, for then we would surely fail, but by the strength of the one who faced torture and torment and sorrow and suffering and pillaring and pain and who prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. And so I'd like to conclude with uh, some of the words that Jesus uh, uttered. Again, the night that he was betrayed, the night that he established the, the symbols of his sacrifice that we partook of a couple of evenings ago. First of all, in John 13, verses 34 and 35. And, and I want to read these words, keeping in mind what I've been saying, that this is what Jesus expects us to do now that we are part of his world, not part of this world. We're still in the world, but we're now part of Jesus' world, part of God's world. And he says in John 13, 34, I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. And how much did he love us? He gave up his life for us. He suffered a cruel, vicious beating for us, a cruel death on the, on the, on the stake for us. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And everyone will know by this, the world will know by this, that you are my disciples. They won't see you fighting in a war against each other and claiming that you are my believers or my followers. They'll see by your love. They won't see you arguing and bickering over politics of whichever country. They will see the love that you have one for another. And everyone will know by this that you are my disciples if you have this love for one another. And then back to John 17. John 17, starting in verse 20. I'm not praying only on their behalf, the behalf of the disciples who were right there with him that evening, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. That's us. It's everybody who's listening to this message. Everybody who's in this room. That they will all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Can, can we picture Jesus and the Father arguing about politics and, and calling each other names over that? Is that even conceivable? I pray that they will be in us so that, so that the world will believe that you sent me. You know, I think sometimes when we look around and say, why are there so few, relatively speaking, so few Christians? Perhaps the answer is that we, we Christians of any generation, have set such a poor example. The people looking at us say, well, if that's what being a Christian means, not interested, 
I'm not impressed. I don't see anything different from anybody else. I don't see this transformation. I don't see this love. It just seemed the same as everybody else. I see better people of, and you name the religion you want to name. So I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave to me, I have given to them. Why? So that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be completely one so that the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. 